Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamu alaikum. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Development Webinars. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. My name is Amanullah Sand, and I facilitate virtual programs at a Teacher Development Webinars. Happy Independence Day at uh, Pakistan and India. We celebrate it on August 14th, while India celebrates Independence Day on August 15th. About teacher development webinars, teacher development webinars is a social action project to support teachers and educators around the world with professional development opportunities. It is an initiative using the rise in online professional development to connect people from around the world with opportunities which they may not have had due to the all normal of best-to-best -best conferences. And now, what a privilege it is to introduce Dr. Joyce Kling. Dr. Joyce Kling is a senior lecturer at Lund University, where she teaches second language teacher education courses to pre-service and in-service teachers. Over the course of her career, she has worked as an English language ESL and EFL teacher, program director and administrator, teacher trainer, researcher, material developer, author, and consultant. Her research interests include English as medium of instruction, EMI, teacher cognition, and language testing and assessment. Her work appears in TESOL Quarterly, Journal of English Medium Instruction, as well as several edited volumes and monographs. The most recent publication is a co-authored monograph entitled My Research in European Higher Education, published by Rutledge in 2022. She is currently ESOL International Association Press 2022 and 2023. We are happy to have your teacher development webinars. Uh, Dr. Joyce, welcome to teacher development webinars. Thank you so much. It's so great to be here. Um, I will go ahead and share my screen now. Let's see if I can oh. get this going. Everybody, you can see my screen? Everything's okay? Yes. Okay, you can. great. Perfect. Well, Good thank you so thank you so much for this invitation to speak today as part of this series. Uh, I want to um Amanda, congratulate you on the success of this series. And I also want to do a little shout out, congratulate you on the recognition that you've received locally for your efforts. It was very nice that uh, you were acknowledged by your institution for your volunteer work uh, with over a hundred webinars. It's really, I'm honored to be part of this initiative. So congratulations. I also need to say happy Independence Day for Pakistan and India. What many of you don't know is that my, my husband was born in Assam up in Northern, Northeastern India and my girls are from Mumbai. So, so the region speaks a great deal to me. So I'm very happy to be a part of this today. Nessie, I need to do a little note of thank you for support on the project. I wanna tell you about, about this chronological overview from the, an Erasmus Plus grant, which is a European uh, grant for um, collaboration. And I wanna thank my colleagues who participated in what I'm gonna call the TAFE project, the Transnational alignment of English competencies for university lectures. And I'll tell you more about that in a minute. Particularly, I need to thank Alessandra Molino, Sovana Kadimova, and uh, Santa Larson, but I'll show you the book at the end so you can see their names on the, on the title too. So I wanna talk about EMI research um, and give a chronological overview. Uh, and I start with this topic. It's something I've been working with in international education and the international classroom. But EMI has had such a surge, particularly over the past 20 years, among applied linguists, among those of us who work with language and language instruction. And um, a great deal of research has gone on. People have tried different theoretical frameworks and methods. And our goal with this project was to try to bring some of this together because it's mostly, so far the research has mostly focused on EMI, English medium instruction phenomena and factors and, and different variables at local institutions and the national level. But we haven't done a lot to look transnationally. And in order for us to move forward at this point, we really need to get a transnational look. And so that's basically what I wanna to talk to you about today is, is looking at what the state of the art of the uh, 
research is and, and provide a, um, a framework at the end to give you an idea of where we might place our own local research. So today I'll start by telling you about this TAKE project. It'll make more sense in a minute. And then go through some EMI research trends in Europe, work on to the framework, and then a few concluding remarks in general uh, about TESOL. Um, as we move forward, as I said, much of what we've done with English medium instruction, and here I mean English content courses at, at higher education, at the tertiary level, uh, has been different in all, our, all of our institutions, all of our uh, regions, our, in our nations. It depends on what's going on. And we know that there's been a great deal of, of mobility and there's uh, of students traveling up until, unfortunately, COVID, which seems to have have halted things a little bit. Um, but also there's been a lot of motivation for internationalization. So let me just start by telling you about uh, this project, the transnational alignment of English competencies for university lectures. Um, for those of you who, whose geography of Europe isn't as keen as, for example, my geography of, of your region in Pakistan is not very strong. I'm situated in Denmark in the north uh, northern uh, southern Scandinavia and Northern Europe. And this project, this TAKE project, it was built uh, by a collaboration of five, five universities. And the five universities came together to look at EMI research over a 20 year period from 1999 to 2019. Uh, and what we tried to do was bring together universities that had a range of experience of uh, working with EMI. So for example, we have in the, in the group, uh, I was situated at the University of Copenhagen and I was affiliated uh, with that institution from 2009 until two weeks ago when I transferred to Lund University in Sweden. But the University of Copenhagen and um, Maastricht University in the Netherlands, we moved south to Yeida. In, in Spain, just outside of Barcelona. We worked with the University of Torino in Italy and then Rijeka uh, in Croatia. And when I say established and less, less established, less experienced, what I mean is that as we came from the North, the people in the Netherlands and in Denmark had a great deal of experience with EMI. In Spain and Italy, it started uh, several years later, and Croatia had only really been involved with EMI for four or five years at the time of this, of this project. In addition to the experience or, or less experience, we are also looking at north, south, east, west to get an idea of, of different activities and different focal points for implementing EMI uh, in institutions. Yeah, there were also two external reviewers. We had. Um, someone from TU Delft in the Netherlands, and also from uh, Madrid in Spain. So we were trying to get a very broad overview of what was going on across Europe, right? So as you can see, uh, I've kind of mapped it out in four, four circles, four modules. The frame, the TAKE project, it had four main uh, outcomes or activities. The first one was to develop what I want to talk to you about today, this EMI framework, uh, to create a, a research or a report on a, a creating a large scale comparative mixed method study to examine the context and apply and how EMI is applied uh, in creating a framework. The second aspect of the project, which I'm not going to go into today, was working to align an assessment for professors, a test for uh, testing content teachers who teach EMI. Uh, the test is called the Test of Oral English Proficiency for Academic Staff. And it's a test I was on a team I developed starting from 2009 with the team at the University of Copenhagen. And we were linking that to the CEFR, to the Common European Framework of Reference, to, to do an alignment and trying to decide if the test could be normed. Uh, and used and do a standard setting procedure. Uh, we worked on with using the framework from the Council of Europe. The third goal or outcome was uh, to develop a teacher training handbook. And this is available for free. We did do this and I'll give you the link at the end, at the end of the hour. And then the last thing was to conduct teacher training workshops. And again, that, that took place at the institutions with the partners, 
partner schools. But today's focus is the Common European Framework, and I want to share with you um, where we came. So I'll move forward uh, quite quickly now. In order to create the framework, we first wanted to look at, at what was going on with the literature, right? We were looking at a chronology of what was happening because we had this idea that many people were conducting the same type of research. People were coming out and conducting a, a, a stakeholder assessment. How did teachers feel about it? How did students feel about it? And we were seemed to be recreating the wheel at every institution and, and redoing it ourselves. So we wanted to see what were people publishing over the course of a 20 year period. First and foremost, we needed to have a mutual definition of EMI. As you know, all of you, there, there are many, many definitions and people use different terms. So as a team, we got together and we all were agreeing that we were going to use this definition. And it comes from Pecoraire and Maelstrom's article in TESOL Quarterly uh, 2018. There was a special issue on EMI. The definition that we're working from was that EMI is a situation where English is used for instructional purposes. English is not the subject being taught. So it's the language of instruction, but we're not using English uh, as a subject that we're focusing on in our instruction. We may be, we may bring in extra instruction, but technically it's not the subject being taught. The third point is that a language of development isn't the primary intended outcome. So at the end of the, of the course, language is typically not being assessed. And the last thing is that in general, English is the second language for most of the participants. I say most because, for example, I am, I do have English as my first language, my mother tongue. And when I teach in Denmark or I teach in Sweden, I am teaching EMI classes, but I have English as my first language, but all of my students have it as their second. So it's the majority of them. So to build our, our literature database and then work on an analysis, we did a very extensive literature search. And the literature search contained uh, searches through academic databases. We went into journal archives. We were looking at Google Scholar citations based on, on hits and number of publications. And any other relevant publications working with um, terms such as EMI, English taught courses, CLIL, um, you name it, across the board, uh, because there had been so many terms used since uh, uh, the beginning of the period, okay? The criteria for inclusion in this database was that this was only going to be research from the five countries I mentioned, Denmark, the Netherlands, Spain, Italy, and Croatia. Uh, we also focused on publication type, uh, we didn't include master's thesis. We didn't include uh, uh, other types of, of documents. And we also wanted to make sure that the participants from, again, from the study, from the, the TAKE project were included. And the last thing was that we ended up all together from the five countries creating a standardized spreadsheet. And in that standardized spreadsheet, we have 21 categories. I'm going to show you a sample of that in a minute. And in those categories, there was a descriptor for all of the closed categories so that we could all be in agreement of what we were putting into this corpus. At the end of the day, this is just uh, four entries and you're not going across the 21 different elements you can see. But, but we created a database and you can see that the database, as I mentioned, we were looking for... Um, Searches that had something to do with EMI or English medium, English taught. We also included integrating content and language in higher education. We included CLIL. Um, anything that fell into the, into the area also that people themselves had, had published in. And then um, the archives of the selected journals were, were also those publishing EMI, uh, anything publishing EMI research. Uh, as I mentioned, we did Google searches and such. Um, so you get an idea, but we, we did this across the board and we ended up with over 200 entries in um, from the five countries, right? 250. So um, at, currently it's over 250. At the time uh, we were just, when we finished with uh, the 2019 search, um, we had just over 200. And in order to validate uh, this, this uh, 
corpus, we did a double coding of about 20% of the entries. And we had four coders, four of us from the team annotated 20% of the entries. And we had an agreement rate of about um, 90%. And in particular, we focused on the 11 categories that were closed, uh, with ones that we thought could be inconsistent with the guidelines, for example, type of publication or area of interest, uh, the foci, the perspective, the type of research method. It was important for us to make sure that that uh, the database was on point. And we did have an agreement rate of about 90%. For those that uh, we disagreed, we did go back, we revised, and in particular also with the names and with uh, the references using AP style and such. So what we were trying to end up with was a comparative analysis. And we could see that we had essentially five areas here we have four, but I'll show you five areas of interest, attitudes, policy, language use, intercultural communication, and the last one being language assessment. Uh, we're hoping to have this to be a sustainable tool that is open. Uh, and uh, if you contact participants, we can lead you to access to the database. Okay. At the time of creating this chronology, you can see the number of entries per take member country in the database. And, and it kind of flows with how long you can see the universities have been using this type of, of um, instructional policy. The pie chart shows the publications by the participating countries uh, with uh, Denmark and having 73, Spain 69, Italy 57, the Netherlands 39, and Croatia only eight, the majority all of which, which came from the University of Rijeka. Okay. I think this is a better picture. This gives you a real overview of what was going on and when literature just exploded. Again, only from these five countries. But if, if we think about, if you were to do, have done a search about English medium instruction before the turn of the century, there was very little in regard to higher education, okay? Before 1999, the majority of the hits for this, they focused on areas where the use of English was the media of instruction, mostly in post-colonial contexts, such as India, Pakistan, Hong Kong, uh, Tanzania, and such. And it wasn't a great deal of discussion uh, in higher education, particularly in Europe. Um, it, it wasn't until the end of the 20th century that we started to have a shift in focus uh, when we started thinking much more about the educational landscape in Europe and the Bologna Agreement. And uh, I, I want to quote from uh, Hultgren, Jensen, and Dimova, who said, um, the changes in the educational landscape in Europe were due to, and I quote, dramatic transformation processes centered on internationalization, marketization, competition, in standardization, right? And this resulted in really extensive impl uh, implementation of instruction conducted through English in countries where English is not typically the language of instruction or the national language, right? But if we go back and you can see, I, I did start already from 1990, 1991. If we look what was going on from 1991 to 1999, the only research that related to EMI really came from the Netherlands as they were already, they were very instrumental in looking at what was going on with international students and publishing um, research articles under headings for EMI and integrating content and language. It was thus, we can see, if you look at this picture, it is mostly, um, we get a big push from 2007, and then the, oh, excuse me, the most dramatic push happens once we get to 15, 16, and 17, where um, publication in Italy just really expanded. And much of this had to do with what was going on locally with their own um, policy situations, where this focus very much was on what was happening at one particular institution. And uh, I'll touch on that after, uh, right. And Croatia came on the scene just towards the end from 2015 and moving forward um, uh, as they began to also have more studies related to, um, to their own attitudinal uh, and, and surveys about EMI and attention. 
So as I mentioned, we ended up finding that we could divide all of this research into eight categories. And these eight categories are, uh, as I said, attitudes. This is the strongest category. Intercultural communication, what we call ICC. Identity, teacher identity, student identity. Language use, and that might be student language use or teacher language use. Uh, learning outcomes, what were the learning outcome goals, testing and assessment, and then training, and the last one being policy. Many of these studies that we see on the screen here had, had multiple foci, okay? Here are those same, the list that I just mentioned. And what's interesting to see is what the different, how the different countries broke down in these. What we see here uh, on the side is first and foremost, that attitudes and policy were, are by far the two areas that had the most research over this 20 year period, right? As I mentioned before, it was very, very common, and it still is very common, that before an institution or a nation moves in to working with EMI, they want to survey um, their, their uh, population, their stakeholders. I can see that there's a hand up. Um, Saifulahi, is this a question you want to ask now, or can we hold on till the end? Okay, I'm just going to keep going. I don't hear anything. Yeah, yeah sure. If you have any questions, uh, you can put them in the chat, and uh, we'll take the questions off of Joyce. Great, thank you. All right. So, so significantly different. Not, not. I shouldn't say that. There's a great difference between attitude between the number of studies you can see with attitudes and policy, and the policy studies really are drawn from two institutions in particular. One being uh, the University of Copenhagen, not just Copenhagen, but also Roskilde University, but from Denmark, where there was a strong focus on something called the policy for parallel language use. And there was a great deal of focus also uh, from the Netherlands, where we're talking about smaller language countries, countries that when internationalization became, uh, became much more of a trend, particularly with Erasmus exchange, English medium instruction was the only viable option for bringing in guest students because we couldn't host students. They didn't speak Danish as opposed to students who went to Spain or went to um, Italy. Those students usually wanted to practice their second language and they would often be looking for language instruction. Now the policy studies that come out of Spain, of course, have to often deal with local language, national language and the influence of English. Uh, and as I mentioned, attitudes run across, and this issue in Spain, where there's so many studies on attitudes, again, has to do with the issues of, of the resurgence of local languages, such as Basque and Catalan, and the role that English plays when we bring a third language into, into this sort of area. Okay. The last group of slides that I want to uh, share with you have to do with research methodology. And this is also quite telling because again, what we can see is if we look at, at the range of research uh, first over on the right, um, in the very beginning, the, the, the Dutch were creating, a, they wrote a conceptual piece about what this means. And then they had a series of empirical studies. But as we move forward, most of the research going on over the course of the years, that they are empirical studies, many of them attitudinal surveys, with conceptual pieces, again, uh, the majority, if we see from, from Denmark and, and, um, and then slightly from the Netherlands and Italy, has to do with policy, these conceptual pieces about what goes on. For Denmark, it a lot of it had to do with maintenance of first language and uh, discussions about first language loss even to the point that before EMI could be implemented in at Danish institutions, the discussion went as far as parliamentary level. Uh, and at the end, uh, the government did vote in favor of universities having their autonomous right to determine what language of instruction. The same with Italy, the case has only just concluded after a number of years at the Politecnico uh, di Milano, where there was a court case where the Academic staff took the university to court in demand of dropping this English medium uh, instruction requirement. And as far as I understand, and someone correct me if I'm wrong, I, I think the 
that the courts just recently voted in favor of the universities, but but it might have gone on appeal. I'm not sure at this point. Um, but we see that the majority of the pieces are empirical studies. Uh, we have fewer conceptual pieces. This has changed a bit since 19. Over the past three years, we've seen many more monographs coming out, but also um, edited volumes from Asia, edited volumes from um, the Middle East. There is a uh, focal area. Just I just saw a book being published just the other day uh, with a new focus on Europe with edited and edited volume. So given all of these timelines and chronologies, and you can now see what people were publishing, we looked at all of these, this 200 plus 250 uh, different publications, and we placed them into uh, this, this graphic, looking at incentives and motivation for the EMI research. What are EMI researchers looking at? And with this in mind, um, we kind of get, we get some insight and, and what we would expect, of course, is the local context and the local educational culture and history of a country really plays a role in the research agenda. So beyond just tracking method or focus, what we broke it down into is four main areas, four quadrants that you can see here on the screen. Let me see if I can focus on them, right? We get second language instruction, policy, quality assurance and stakeholders, right? And so can I get out of that? I didn't want that to happen. Um, when we look at these four quadrants, we can see that um, each of these are broken down into sub areas of what they're doing. Let's, let's take them one at a time. If we start here on the, um, on the left with second language instruction, you can see from the database that um, the five nations all are concerned with something to do with with how the language, how the uh, what the language, the meaning of what happens when you bring this in. But as I mentioned, the uh, Netherlands and Denmark had a much longer history in teaching in English than, say, some of the Southern European countries. And because of that, the focus in those countries really started to be on content and language integrated learning um, and integrating content and language in higher education. As we move south, there was a much more of a focus on bilingual education, where much of the literature coming out of Spain, we have researchers looking into ministerial um, implementation of bilingual programs already in elementary schools and in upper secondary schools in order to support the students and their English language and to help them get a head start as they move forward. Interestingly also was that in Spain, ESP has traditionally had a great deal of support from universities, but we're now seeing, particularly at an institution like uh, IEDA in Spain, a push a move away from EAP into what we want to call EMI and using EMI to increase English language training, where they are starting to have a situation where the learning outcomes are focused not only on content, but on language. We move over to the right in terms of policy. And in policy, as I mentioned, in the early days, um, this Nordic parallel language use policy really drove the implementation of EMI and the researchers in um, Denmark and also in Sweden, much of the research. I, I don't include Sweden here in the project, but if we go back this Nordic parallel language use policy, uh, it became a hot topic for discussion and dissemination. And as I said, the Con the conflict uh, on the on the ground at the Politecnico di Milano, it drove research agenda for policy in Italy. Again, integration of content and language in higher ed became a very strong focus, and it is here where in the Netherlands, uh, Robert Wilkinson, Bob Wilkinson, who's been the chair of the ICHLE Association um, for. Uh, 15 years, number of years. Um, I was on the board of that association a few years ago. It really took over and Bob was part of um, a movement of a number of edited volumes, if you're interested in looking at those, and also uh, a focus now on Englishization across Europe and what's happening. As in the Netherlands, 
there are some issues with too many courses going on in English. And a new volume was just published a year ago, looking at the European nations uh, and their implementation of English and what it means for their educational system. Okay. Next, we move down to the bottom right quadrant about quality assurance. And aspects of quality assurance and research really came out of many of these attitudinal studies. Okay. First and foremost, there was a huge focus on international rankings and collaboration. And people wanted to be able to look into what did it mean to have English as a language of instruction to be able to move forward in the international rankings and attract. The idea originally being that we would be able to attract more and better researchers and students to our institutions. So as the policies change and they're being implemented, we need to, we're starting to look then at what's the teacher training history in a particular country and what are the needs? There's been a great deal of focus over the past few years about the needs for teachers in terms of pedagogy, in terms of language training. Um, in particular, again, I said in Denmark was really the only country in this group that had a uh, institutionally situated test for certif certifying lecturers language for EMI. And overall, a big push in the research about discussing sustainability for all of these movements. Right. Um, with, uh, I use Croatia as an example here, they've spent a great deal of time in not only looking at attitudinal surveys, but also looking at how to increase teacher training and bring in the international classroom and EMI into their regular teacher training situations and making it a sustainable activity so it holds for the future. Right. The last corner has to do with uh, stakeholders. And in terms of stakeholders, we're talking about everyone involved, whether it's the students, uh, the staff, the administrators, the maintenance staff, the people who have to work around bringing in foreign students or working in English. And we see that much of the discussion about stakeholders had to do with what happens post Bologna Agreement. When we opened up the borders in Europe and people started moving, what was going to happen with English? being the medium of instruction, what happens when we bring in second language academic and professional use, and for the students really trying to pump up international employment and looking at the world sustainability goals and having global citizenship for our students where they get a much more um, uh, focus on intercultural communication and building their intercultural communicative competencies. And again, this, this was, is research that we see across the board in all of the studies. So this is the, a model that we had about incentives for motivation in EMI and research. And, and uh, this is coming from our, our new volume, and you can read more about that in that book. But it brings us to this common EMI framework that, that I, I was leading up to. When we review all of this literature, we see that um, the reports around the world, we, we have to start to differentiate between context. And from context, looking then at policy and within the policies, thinking about language, pedagogy, and intercultural communication or, or culture, educational cultures. And we can see this somewhat like an onion or Russian babushka stacking dolls, but within each other. I point out context in particular because in reading some of the literature, you get the impression that EMI is one, one aspect, one thing, but we know that it's not a monolithic situation. It, it is different depending on where your institution lies and in what part of the world and what region, also what type of institution. So I lay this out as English dominant, uh, so universities and English dominant branch campuses and non-English dominant. And I want to, um, let me just shed some light on what I mean by that and we'll come back to the framework. When I think about context, and I worked this out with, with uh, Sladanka Dimova, um, we talk about this in our 2020 edited volume. We can have English dominant universities in English dominant settings, all right? And, and the examples I have are a couple of my own alma mater, 
the University of Michigan is a state institution in the state of Michigan, and it is English dominant. There's never a question about what language is going to be used in the classroom, unless, of course, it's a foreign language class, but in content courses. Excuse me. Same with Harvard University. This isn't a discussion when they're sitting down to do course planning, what language will the course be like? So English dominant universities in English dominant settings, areas we've often called Anglophone universities, but it could be also in, in other parts of the world. The second area are non-English dominant universities in non-English dominant settings. And again, I am now situated, affiliated with Lund University in Sweden, or my previous affiliation, um, uh, the University of Copenhagen in Denmark. We also have the University of Rijeka in Croatia. English is not the national language. It's a language of instruction chosen for higher education in a non-English dominant context. And then the third area, which we found very important to talk about, is an English dominant university branch campus in a non-English dominant setting where life and activities are, are different. And here we're talking about the University of Nottingham, which has from England, which has uh, the UK, branch campuses in China and Malaysia. We can think of Temple University, which is based out of the United States, but has a Jap Japan uh, campus, or Texas A&M University and its University of Qatar. Right? Let me just walk through these three a little bit more so we get a better idea of, of what this might mean for the research and what it means for the framework. In these non-English dominant universities in non-dominant settings, this has truly been the growing trend in Asia. And when we're talking about EMI, this is often what we're talking about, where there seems to many feel maybe an imposition of English on uh, a foreign national a tertiary institution. English is often introduced as an additional medium of instruction to the local or the national language for the purpose of internationalization. There are some similarities between the institutions. When we looked at the five tank countries, we could see some, several similarities, particularly in terms of teachers' attitudes, aspects of, of challenges, and also in terms of opportunities for staff and for students. But very often the language policies and, and practices at the local level, they vary because of particularities of stakeholder needs. And then the local students, typically they don't, they don't have to do anything to qualify for enrollment. So when we look at the students in um, Denmark or where I am now in Sweden, students automatically matriculate into EMI instruction based on their upper secondary school qualifications. They don't need to take a TOEFL or an IELTS test. That, if, if you're coming from another country, um, in Denmark, from outside Scandinavia, you would. If you were coming from South America or from Asia, someone would have to take an external test. In terms of branch campuses, which were very interesting for us to focus on, here we had that they often were a very strong agent of change in the implementation of EMI. It was usually decided at a much, at a very high level, at the ministerial level, to bring in a foreign university into a local context as a push to have more English medium instruction. When those institutions come, they import curricula. They import educational values. They import education and language policies from the English dominant educational systems. So I had a chance to visit um, Texas A&M in Qatar and it was Texas A&M, but situated in Qatar. And so all of the curricula, all of the information, all, even, up, even with the um, human resources of how people are hired, it was based on an American university context. This can lack, lead to a lack of alignment between local educational systems and the branch university, which often works under very different local context situations. It may require local students to compete uh, foundation programs, uh, to, excuse me, to complete foundation programs to qualify. If their English isn't strong enough, they may need to do a year or two in what we would call a pre-sessional or foundation English for academic purposes program. It may often 
I say often, it may divide access to education on socioeconomic lines. Many of these branch campuses are quite um, expensive and it is open to people who have the means. And with all of this, it can have a great deal on local language policies, also that trickle down to the elementary and secondary school levels. And so we have certain countries that may flip between national language and English, where the students are kind of caught in between of where to focus. These post-colonial influences have been documented a bit. We see English as a medium instruction studies based on pragmatic and political decisions in February 2020, Mabu 2017, and uh, particularly from Iceland, um, where uh, Bitna Abramsdottir did a, has written quite a bit about the focus of language curricula that has to be completed based on the Danish national policy and the Icelandic national policy, as many students from Iceland choose to come to Denmark, they're, they're given entry into the Danish educational system. So got back to the framework. Within the frameworks, we focused a little bit here now on, um, on this context, but I want to move to look at, at the policies. And these are often from a departmental level. They could be institutional if they're coming top down, national if they're very coming from top down, or international when institutions are part of a consortium. And these policy initiatives, uh, because they may be local or national, um, they push the agenda which will change the way a teacher might be expected to teach. Um, in some contexts, we find that the change in population happens and you've got a very multinational group and in others you have national students taught by a local instructor who are using English in what some feel to be somewhat of a, um, a forced nature, uh, not as natural. I want to share with you maybe some ideas here, pedagogy and local context with focus. When we think about what happens in terms of policy change and how that might lead to changes in pedagogy and, and teaching methodologies. The fact that the stakeholders in the EMI classroom are, are typically using a second language, it determines how we are going to go about the teaching. I have three different situations listed here on the screen, and I'll just run through these with the idea of what happens in terms of policies that may come from below or may come from above. If the policy is simply to change the language, and this unfortunately is often interpreted as simply um, just translating your materials and going, go ahead, you'll teach. But we have a change of language where the only thing that's happening is that the teaching is switching from local national language to English. In this case, the student population typically is the same. The students are the same. They may even have the same teacher that they had for the same topic in, in their other language. And in that case, teaching approaches often remain the same. And it's much harder to move if an institution has a desire to push towards more student-centered teaching or more active learning. In institutions that are still very teacher-focused, if the only change is change of language, it'll be very hard to change teaching approaches. They often remain the same. The second area is change of language and also a change of teaching and learning goals. And in this case, we see that there's a switch to English. And again, the student population may remain the same, but there may be an, a policy change. Again, it might be local, it might be national, it might be regional expectations to change the teaching approaches. And that may come because we've inserted intended learning out goals that the students are also expected to improve their English or be able to develop some sort of academic literacy, including language for specific purposes. And we might be then providing extra training for the teachers because there's an expectation to change the teaching approaches. The third model related to pedagogy and language and context and focus is where there's a change of language, you have a change of teaching and learning goals, so your intended learning goals also change, but you also have a change of student population where now you have a multilingual, multicultural classroom. And so we switch to English, 
the student population becomes multinational and they there might be small pockets, but English is now the academic lingua franca. And the expectations to change teaching approaches are often quite high as international students are not always aware of what the local educational culture is and will need assistance moving forward. I bring up these three uh, aspects of our pedagogy and local context, because when we look back at this framework, again, we have to take those policies and what's going on in the classroom, put it within the context. Is it an English dominant institution? Is it a branch campus of an English dominant institution? Or is it a non-English dominant university in a non-English dominant context? And then really thinking about these three aspects, language, pedagogy, and culture. With language, pedagogy, and culture, these three points have been circling for a number of years now in, in the research of, of where breakdown can take place. With lecture, with language, we might be looking at certifying lecturers and different institutions have, diff, have achieved, um, declared, or made uh, policies. Some say C1, others will say B2+, plus, and that will be a policy, again, it might be departmental, institutional, national, or international, and based on the context. But with language, we're also considering the students, what are their admission requirements? We're looking at how things are supported. Is there close support or ESP or EAP? And are there post-entry tests? And these are all aspects that fall within areas of researching based on policy and context. If we move south there, ICC, this has to do with who your students are, are they multilingual, multicultural students? What about your lectures? And what's going on with the educational culture? And lastly, pedagogy, which is getting a great deal of focus right now. Thinking about what are our curricular goals? Do we want to include particular language learning goals in a content course on biology or chemistry? Uh, has there been a teaching reform? What about teacher identities? Will they feel that they may maintain their professional identity as researchers and teachers if they have to teach in their second language. And, and also just in terms of pedagogy, if we're including CLIL, who's responsible? Is it the content teacher? Are we working with language instructors in a more of a soft CLIL format? So this is the common EMI framework that developed from all of the looking at this chronology of research. I share with you a few of the publications I've mentioned. Uh, in particular, on the left, um, this book is from uh, 2018 that I wrote with Birgit Hendrickson and Anna Holman. And this was really a focus on what was going on in Scandinavia and in Denmark. The second book I mentioned um, uh, when I was talking about the local context, Integrating Content and Language in Multi-Universities. This is an edited volume. And the last is the book that just came out about a month ago, This Evolution of EMI Research in European Higher Education, where my co-authors and I really work through all of the different aspects and, and flesh them out in the different chapters. Most importantly, if you're thinking about working, if you yourself have to do some teacher training and helping um, your uh, content teachers. If you go to this handbook, this is the handbook that we use with training. Uh, and there is a great deal of free material. You can see we also have a report on, um, on our alignment of our test. And you can see that there. There's also a second European project that I was a part of. It's called EQUIP, the Educational Quality at Universities for in inclusive international programs. And there's more teacher training material there also for training the trainers. Okay. And I'll come back, I'll put the, the links up again at the end. Okay. When we think about the chronology of research and how it plays in developing this, this framework for the future, we see that we have limited studies related to pre and post training of lectures. Uh, we'd like to benefit from more empirical data. We need to think about uh, looking at tools of assessment for proficiency, intercultural communication. But most importantly, we need more empirical data that goes beyond attitudinal studies. We need to be looking at what's going on uh, with language. Thus far, we've looked at speech rate, rhetorical style, domain loss and policy. There's been focus on form, linguistic markers, meta discourse markers, repetition and phrasing. And, and we want to look at this, but we also want to start to look at it on a transnational level. 
looking across and moving beyond, as I mentioned, just what's going on at the local level. I'm going to stop there with this, but I do, if you'll indulge me for two minutes, because in my role as president of TESOL International Association, I just want to show you a couple slides about why you, if you are not a member at this point, you might want to engage with TESOL. Uh, just two slides here. Uh, TESOL International Association, it's an international association uh, with a membership of over 13,000 people of English language teachers and other professionals across 150 countries. Many of you may be um, members of your local affiliate. And when people join, they can experience all of the things that come along with it. And I got one more slide. Right? It's what we do is that we have journals and books. You can advance your career. There are services where you can have um, looking at uh, job announcements. You can build your network being part of interest sections or being part of professional learning networks or councils. And lastly, you can also attend activities. I'm going to push one activity going on. It's called Elevate, and it's going to be run October 18th and 19th. And it's for primary and secondary teachers, particularly uh, new. So I'll stop there and I'll let, and I have a feeling we want to talk about questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Joyce, for this wonderful talk and sharing uh, uh, about the Soul International Association and uh, uh, you know the recent event which is going to happen called Elevate. So now the floor is open for the question and answers. If you have any questions, please feel free to share in the chat. And while I'm looking at the chat, I have some comments. Uh, Dr. McKing says, only change of language also requires change to teaching approach, in my humble opinion, at least uh, subliminally or effectively. Sadly, it does not always happen. Right. Hi, Mick. Nice to see you here today. Um, I do agree. We, 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 I think when we're just talking about in general teaching in higher education, tertiary level, we are all hoping that there is more of a push moving toward student-centered active learning. But we've also had a number of discussions, even in, in this project and um, with uh, Slobodanka and Alessandro Molino, uh, we just published an article in the most recent TERF, um, the Research Foundation's book, where we spoke to teachers and teacher cognition studies. And some of the older teachers had concerns that while they were changing, their, the expectation that they were going to change their pedagogy completely uh, made them nervous because they felt comfortable teaching in English, but they didn't see that they were going to change their pedagogy greatly given their local context. While I agree it would be better if we could, um, very often the compensatory strategies that they've developed can carry on. Um, that said, yes, I agree with you, Mick. Uh, it, it is our goal. Great. So and next we have a question on YouTube. It's from Ksenia. She says, Dear Dr. Joyce Kling, thank you for the brilliant presentation. Please, can you define it and can you explain the difference for EMI, EME, and EMEMUS? Right. I, I can't spend too long on this. English medium instruction really is has been a focus and more of an umbrella term about what's going on at a policy level with the implementation of the use of English in higher education. Uh, the EME or immense uh, activities is um, a framework that Emma Defus and Uta Smith have developed. And it really uh, it's a much broader spectrum and it, it breaks down the different aspects. I, 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 it goes beyond just this policy initiative and in saying we're going to be teaching in English and looks at all of the different interplays of what's going on both with language and context and um, all the other elements. I, 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 don't, I can't do it justice here, but I do recommend that you look up their work and, and get an idea. It talks about not just that English is being used for instruction, but really it, that it's an entire educational uh, initiative and framework that we need to be thinking about all the way through our educational system. Great. Next, we have uh, Navu asking, do you think that EMI pedagogies are different between English speaking countries and non English speaking countries? Yeah. 
I, I tend to hesitate to talk about EMI pedagogies, often because locally we have educational cultures and we have particular ways that people might teach in a national setting. And I bring, for example, in, in Denmark, we have a long history of what we call oral exams. So at the end of the semester, students come and they take an oral exam on all topics. Some are written exams, some are oral. This is something that doesn't take place in the United States. As, as a graduate of a couple institute, three institutions in the United States, I never took an oral exam. So the teachers wouldn't be teaching in a way that would eventually, if we think of alignment between teaching and expectations on the exam, they're not working in in to support my oral production in that same way. Given that we're not assessing teachers at a national level in their L1, it's hard for me to say that we have to be assessing teachers in a particular EMI way in their L2 because that would be discriminatory against their colleagues who aren't teaching in English in terms of what they have to do. So there, I do agree, we really want to be moving towards student-centered active learning uh, and helping teachers who aren't comfortable with that. And again, that might that often comes through language teachers supporting content teachers in developing their fluency, developing more of a feeling of ease to be able to break away from a manuscript and interact with their students uh, more face-to-face. -face. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. So next we have Shamim asking that why does EMI contradict with uh, translanguaging? EMI shouldn't contradict with translanguaging. I think in many cases, particularly in the early years, there was a great deal of pressure to say we stay in English. I will openly tell you when I teach an EMI class or the many classes I've observed, the students interact in their first language and their second language. In group work, they may be speaking one or two languages, but when they come back to front, uh, they'll be speaking in, in English. If I go to a group where I share one of the languages they're speaking, I may clarify something in that language, but then bring it back to English. There are other teachers locally who feel very strongly that they want to also improve their English. And they may have a language policy with their students that says, while we're here, we're going to use English only because we don't want to discriminate that we're 85 or 90 percent of one language and only two or three people who don't speak the other. So try to speak English. I am a strong believer that it shouldn't discriminate and I promote translanguaging in the EMI classroom. Wonderful. Uh, we have a question from uh, William Henderson and he says, uh, what is Englishization and how is it an incentive with regards to policy making? Yeah. There's been a great deal of, of press, particularly in, in the Netherlands, that um, the English language has taken over the educational system to the point that it is a loss for a local or national language. And that measures need to be taken in terms of the number of courses or the quantity of material uh, being used in a foreign language in a national setting. Uh, I mentioned earlier that, that this discussion in, in Denmark um, really went to the parliamentary level because I, I live in a welfare state where students do not pay tuition to go to university. So there was a strong question, can you run courses in a language that's not the national language Using state money, is that is that a fair situation? Now, in Scandinavia, one of the typical EMI policies, particularly in Denmark, was that unless it was part of an Erasmus exchange or a special program, the majority of undergraduate studies to develop disciplinary literacy goes on in Danish, in the first language. And it's only first at the graduate level that we have a very strong, and I mean very strong push for English medium. Some of that has to do with the fact that literature is not available in Danish. We just don't publish. We don't have enough people. Uh, the country is the size of a very small town in India or Pakistan. Um, we just don't have material, but also in order to develop global citizens and bring students to the international market, we do want them to develop this bilingual literacy. Uh, but Englishization is often um, a concern particularly if, if things have gone too far. And I believe in the Netherlands, they're trying to pull it back a little bit at this point. 
Great. Uh, thank you so very much, uh, Dr. Dryas, for this uh, wonderful uh, webinar. And uh, your project on EMI seems great. And thanks for sharing uh, of, uh, about your pro uh, project. So in the last, any final message, a final word for our audience? I just hope that we see more transnational uh, research that we start sharing. We're seeing a little bit more, but also moving between just regions. And so instead of saying European or Asian, that, that we start working together on, on more global projects to see what's coming up. What do we have in common and what really is local or, or national in terms of, of policies uh, and implementation? And Wonderful. thank you so much for this. It's really been a pleasure. Thanks very much, uh, a pleasure to all us. And uh, we appreciate your time. I know you have been busy with a lot of work, but uh, yeah, thanks for taking uh, your Thank time. You. I really appreciate uh, your support. Thank and you. for the participants who want uh, a certificate for this uh, webinar, you can email us at info.tdwebinars at the rate of gmail.com. For our future webinars, please visit www.tdwebinars.org. You can share your takeaways uh, from this wonderful webinar using hashtag TDWebinars and tag us on Twitter at TDWebinars. We are available on all our social media channels, Twitter, LinkedIn, Instagram, and Facebook. And please uh, do subscribe to a uh, YouTube channel. We stream uh, live webinars on a uh, teacher development webinars YouTube channel. So yeah, keep supporting us. Thanks very much for joining us. Have a good day.